coming in. Welcome everybody. If you're joining us, we're going to pause for just a moment as the room populates and everybody joins us. We'll get started in just a minute. If you're just joining us, thanks for coming. Uh, we're giving folks just a minute to go ahead and log in. Log in. We are oversubscribed. We had 150 registrants for a session that can hold 100. Uh, so we'll let folks come on in and we'll get started in just a moment. And thanks, Linda. I agree. This is an awesome group. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for enjoying us this evening here at Focus St. Louis in our ongoing series on the subject of change making, racial equity, policing reform, policy reform in the St. Louis region. The panel tonight is entitled Protests and Power Holders, uh, the Role of Inside Changemaker. The idea here is that we've been witnessing uh, the power of spontaneous and massive uh, uh, demonstrations that have been altering the uh, nature of the American conversation. Now, history teaches us that any successful movement for change must include people at every step of the way and in every uh, place, you know, including folks out on the street protesting and in leadership voices inside of it, institutions, uh, civic institutions and the halls of power who harness the momentum coming from acts of civil defiance in the streets. Now, this is historically a very controversial position involving a difficult balance between staying at the tables of power and calling at the same time for that table to change. Now, interestingly, I think this is a space where St. Louis is ahead of the curve, especially since 2014. We have a deep bench of experience when it comes to this role. We've gone through several electoral cycles and have some folks in office, appointed office, and of course, uh, as employees that have been there for a long time, that uh, understand this role and have been exercising their influence in this way. This forum assembles a few of those who are exercising their influence inside of civic institutions on these changes. We'll discuss their roles both as civic leaders, as changes, and uh, what changes are on the horizon inside of their institutions. Before we do so, I'd like to take just a moment um, and close this for a moment and start with a poll for the audience. And I'm gonna go ahead and allow the panelists to vote here. So this is a poll for the audience to get a sense of where you are at. I'd like to ask all of you, if you see a headline that pronounces that a young black male has been shot by the police and it's unclear whether he was armed or not, what's that initial gut reaction? Try to be honest here. By the way, this poll is anonymous. No one's going to know how you answer. Uh, so please be as honest as you can in terms of what is your gut reaction to that headline when you see it at first. Are you generally police supporting, assuming the officer probably had a good reason for using lethal force? Are you cautiously police supporting, giving the officer the benefit of a doubt, but wanna know more? Are you objectively neutral, have no prior opinions about such cases and evaluate on a case by case basis? Are you cautiously police skeptical, give the young black male the benefit of a doubt, but want to know more? 
Or are you generally police skeptical? Assume the officer probably did not have good reason for using lethal force. So we're gonna give folks just a couple of uh, 30 seconds more here to go ahead and answer that question so we can get a sense of where our audience sits and uh, reflect this back at them a little bit. Okay, three, two, if you wanna get your answer in, get it in now. One, and close. It looks like the winner uh, is cautiously police skeptical. Give the young black male the benefit of a doubt, but want to know more. Um, we definitely have some folks on the generally police skeptical end of the spectrum, all, but we go all the way over to the other end. And I'm glad that we've got a diverse audience here uh, that, wants to, that wants to hear this from many perspectives. Uh, now, the important point here is that uh, the reason that I brought this poll up because one of the first things that happens when we start discussing these changes is that we're forced into this idea of a simple divide. The simple divide between those who, uh, those who are pro-cop and those who are anti-cop. This is something I want to talk about for just a second before we get going. I want to establish two truths. Number one, there's the, uh, when we look at pictures like this, we often get forced into, I'm standing on one side or the other. And the, of course, reality isn't that simple. There are several truths involved here. The first is the ongoing and historical legacy of profound self-sacrifice and public service by individuals who serve in criminal justice institutions. I've taught at the County Police Academy. I've known police officers and their families who, and have witnessed the sacrifice that they make. However, that is true right alongside a second truth, which is the historical and ongoing legacy of violent racial oppression under color of law by the individuals and institutions of criminal justice. Both of these legacies exist at the same time inside of that institution of policing. That is a hard thing to keep in your mind at once. It is a difficult thing to reconcile, but such is the nature of complex modern institutions. I wanted to put that on the table right up front so that everyone saw that they could stay at the table uh, and that wherever from the spectrum of views on this you're coming from, we, uh, we welcome you and we hope that this conversation provides uh, some progress. So moving right into our panel discussion, I would like very much to thank uh, my panelists. I'm going to introduce them with name and title. I'm not gonna do long bios. All of the participants should have had bios uh, for these uh, panelists emailed to you. Uh, they are an incredibly impressive list of individuals, starting with Sergeant Heather Taylor, the president of the Ethical Society of Police of the City of St. Louis, which also recently signed an MOU with the county. Congratulations on that. Uh, we uh, Wesley Bell, the St. Louis County prosecutor, who I'm sure is uh, well known to our audience. Dr. L.J. Punch, the St. Louis County, one of five St. Louis County police commissioners recently appointed uh, by County Executive Sam Page to that commission, and Lisa Clancy, chair of the St. Louis County Council. Thank you all for being here today. I'm gonna, you're, absolutely, I'm gonna start off right off with our first question. We've got a lot of information uh, to cover today. So I invited you to speak here tonight uh, under the characterization, I have characterized you as insider change makers. I use that description because each of you hold positions via election, appointment, or employment that places you inside halls of power and at the table when it comes to uh, the development of policy and power structures and function and culture inside of institutions uh, here in the St. Louis region. On the other hand, each of you has also distinguished yourself and self-identified as agents of change when it comes to how those institutions wield power. Uh, I believe I'm right in saying that at some point or another, each of you has been out in the streets protesting yourself uh, over the last few years. 
But as a first question, I'd like to ask each of you, are you okay with this characterization of you as inside change maker? And if so, what does that description mean to you? How do you see yourself inhabiting the difficult space of balancing that seat at the table against calling for the table to change? Who would like to start off first on that one? <laughs> I'm going to call on you. I can go. All right, LJ, thank you. So um, to say that I was an unlikely um, candidate and a, honestly a reluctant candidate to join the St. Louis County Police uh, Commission, um, the Board of Police Commissioners is, is a total understatement. I um, in no way had postured or positioned myself to have such a, a role and um, uh, was actually unwilling to do the role when I was first first asked to do it. And so, I mean, I just total clarity there. Um, this was, I think sometimes people think when you end up in roles like that, you planned it, I did not plan it. Um, and I really do agree uh, and also disagree with the, the idea that I'm there as a inside change maker because the only reason why I said yes, the only reason why I said yes was that so many community members who I knew through other work and other relationships came to me and said, please do this. Um, I had to learn a lot uh, to even understand what the role was. I had to really, um, decide how I would do the role because I didn't see an example in front of me that kind of made sense for how I could be in that role. And I still, still have tons to learn about the role. So in the one way, I totally agree. The only reason why I did it was in a response to the community's call to action. And at the same time, I would say it's not for me to presume at all my relevance or my role in it because you know this is not my life's work. This is me fulfilling you know a duty the best I can. I think the change makers are the folks who work in the department who work for the department. They're the ones who are going to actually have to make the change. So it, it's a little bit of an uncomfortable title and the role is an uncomfortable role uh, because it's not one I ever envisioned envision doing. But at the same time, I've been willing to, to take on the role and, and been digging deep and grappling to try to do the work that the role requires. Okay. Thank you. And I, so, I might, okay, no. Lisa. Go, oh, go ahead, Wally. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have a follow That's up? part of it. I, I was going to uh, point to, to Heather since LJ kind of said, look, it's, it's the folks uh, inside, you know, those departments that are actually going to end up having to make the change. Uh, and I know, Heather, you're seen as a role model uh, for a lot of folks in that way. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how you see yourself as an insider change maker and what's that meant to you? I guess I, I am. Um, some days I'm drowning. I, you know, that's just the reality. Some days I'm literally drowning. Um, it's emotional. It's, um, you know, you, you think about the microaggressions that are present with everyone that's just on this panel that you endure, you endure every single day. And it is overwhelming. Some days I'm drowning. Some days I think I'm making um, change, that there are some people listening to me internally. And most importantly, you know, the encounters that you have in the community, especially with children. Uh, for me, you know, that's why I became a police officer. I never imagined that um, even coming from a background with, and I'm murdered by a deputy marshal here. Um, even with that, you know, I never imagined that I would evolve into this, that uh, that never really crossed my mind. I just wanted to be a police officer. I just wanted to go in and protect children. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to protect children and help. And in the process, you saw so many things that were so wrong that you like, well, I have a big mouth, so I'm going to, I don't like that. I don't like um, the way some officers are treated by the community. I don't like the way the community is treated by officers. And it just turned into what it is, I, I guess I'm a change maker. You know, I, I'm going to stand up for, I don't care who you are, uh, white, black, uh, male, female, 
whoever you are, if you're wronged, nobody has a right to, to mistreat you. And especially if they're wearing this uniform, it just kind of evolved into this. I didn't go into it with that thought process. I, my goal was to um, arrest people that uh, abused children. That's why I wanted to become a police officer. And, you know, it just kind of evolved into this. So I guess I'm a change maker. I appreciate that title, but um, it, that, that's not what I came into it for. I, I have to say, I appreciate the humility being shown here uh, among folks, because uh, I do think uh, uh, that you all deserve the title, but how you feel it is up, uh, is up to you. So, Elisa, uh, let's move on to you. How do you feel about uh, that, that title or that role? Well, I think similar to some of the other sentiments that have been shared, um, you know, seven years ago, if you would have asked me if I thought I would be on the St. Louis County Council, I would have been like, what is that? I mean, I really wasn't even paying attention to local government until 2014. So this is also something I did not forecast for myself. Um, I think it would be disingenuous for me to say that I'm not an inside change maker, but I also feel like that doesn't mean that I always feel like I'm an insider. Um, in a lot of ways, I still feel like an outsider um, in this role. I'm, I'm young. Um, I have a, a young child, so I'm a very active parent right now. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm getting started in my career. Um, I mean, I'm 35, so I've, I've done some things before coming here, but this is my first position as an elected official. I come from a social work and education background, not law. Um, and so I, you know, those are things that I bring to this as well. Um, and I think that that's important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wesley, uh, same question to you. Um, first, I want to uh, acknowledge Focus. I was a, in one of the Focus classes. It was an amazing experience, Wally. Um, thank you as well for, for your engagement and, and things that you've been doing. Um, I can honestly say, and and I think everyone on this panel will know that I'm being honest when I say that I'm a fan of every single one of you all. And, it, and this is, I've been on a lot of panels and this is one I've been looking forward to. Um, and so with me, if you would have asked me 10 years ago what I was going to be doing 10 years from then or 20 years from now, I had my dream job. I was, a, I was practicing um, as an attorney, but, but I was a professor. I headed the criminal justice department at St. Louis Community College, and I thought that I was going to retire. Um, as a matter of fact, there were probably one or two positions that I would, ev that I would have considered um, 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 leaving for, um, for, for that position. And this wasn't on that list um, because it just wasn't on the forefront. Um, and for me, it was a culmination of events. I, I believe in living close to work. So I moved to Ferguson because Flow Valley is in Ferguson and I wanted to be close to work. And a few years later, Ferguson became Ferguson. And, um, and just like, um, and I'm gonna call Heather out. Um, and she says that she's not a change maker. That is a bunch of BS. <laughs> you are absolutely a change maker. And, um, and in the space that Heather occupies, the voice that she brings, um, I, don't, I don't know if you realize, and I, and I think Heather's just being Heather, but I don't think she realizes how inspirational is she, she is to so many people because she does um, um, authentically walk that line by saying, hey, I, I do support law enforcement. I know that it's a tough job, but at the same time, calling people out, I digress. Uh, but for me, it was a culmination of events. And so um, being in Ferguson with my background, I thought, look, I had been talking about community policing. I had actually given a couple speeches on community policing in 2013, and no one showed up at the college. And after Ferguson happened and the cameras came, they're interviewing everyone. And I was one that um, they happened to pick as an interview or interviewee, interviewer. I wasn't in an elected position. And and I brought up the need for public, for community policing. And as a result of those things, it planted the seed, you know, maybe I should run for city council because I had no interest in running for city council. And once I was on the council as an attorney, I was selected to be one of the 
uh, negotiators on with for the, to create the Ferguson consent decree. And that was an eye opening learning experience, if you will. Um, and I'm gonna give a quick example if you'll indulge me. Um, many know growing up in this area that occupancy permits the way that they have been abused in this in this region for so long. But if you didn't, if you've never been out of this region, it was normal. So even as an attorney, and I was a, I started off as a public defender and I did defense work. So when you look at me as a prosecutor, that's only been the last year and a half. The rest of my time has been doing defense work. And so even as as much of an advocate I was for individuals' rights, I even didn't think much of it until sitting in the room with them. And they were like, you know, that's kind of a violation of constitutional rights. And that's not how they're supposed to be used. And in other words, when law enforcement uses occupancy permits to run people and get and make arrests. And, and, it, and the light bulb uh, came on in my head in a lot of different ways. And so by turning that ship in Ferguson, if you will, we, are, we were able to bring community policing, we were able to bring court reforms, and there's still a lot more to do in the region, but those are things that we were able to do. And then you start thinking, okay, huh, this is something that should be happening countywide. And I wasn't a big fan of the person who occupied this space before me. And I thought that, you know, this is an opportunity that we can start bringing long-term uh, change to this region. And, and so that office came in the crosshairs and, and with the help of a coalition of, of, of great people and, and, and grassroots organizations, we were able to do it. And so um, I wouldn't say it was reluctant, but um, like LJ said, it wasn't planned. It, I, the, the, the similarities here are really interesting in terms of the story you tell about landing in public office. And maybe we should say, you didn't land in public office, public office landed on you, to quote a, a, a comedian. Um, so that kind of leads me into a follow-up question I'd like to ask. If you sense that your role as a leader in a public space um, although you had to jump through some hoops, especially if you got elected, right? That's a whole lot of work. So, I mean, you had to jump through some hoops to get there, but if you feel like it's something that happened to you, it wasn't something that you planned, something that you felt needed to happen given what you saw happening around you. Since all of you have been in those offices, something else has happened to all of us and to the country, uh, namely a massive uprise and the largest protest movement this country possibly has ever seen in response to the murder of George Floyd and, uh, of course, the wider issue of police brutality. And I'd like to hear from you, what has that done how has that changed your work in office? The fact that issues that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, that you have some control, some power over, um, and probably not as much as people who sit on the outside think you have, right? Uh, but th those are the subject of protests by millions of people around the country and even around the world. Does that make it easier for you to make change? Does that make it harder for you to make change? How has that affected your job and the work uh, that you're doing? Um, Heather, maybe I'll start with you since the, the, the police are, are so directly the object of these protests, uh, in addition to the institution that has to try to moderate or control those protests in, in, in one way. That is an incredibly complex space for a police institution to sit. How has that affected you? It's definitely helped. I can say that. Um, I appreciate that we have more people out there wanting to hold police officers accountable, especially when we're wrong. You know, um, it has been difficult, a difficult space to occupy. Uh, we're basically addressing systemic racism every single day. And we have pockets of people that recognize it, like, you know, the panel here. We recognize that it exists in law enforcement. It's been a problem for years, but there are other people who didn't know that it was a problem. And so you have nationally people recognizing, wow, this is systemic racism in law enforcement. And unfortunately, you have officers that are showing every single day in, you know, how horrible we are sometimes. And I am not a believer that 
everyone in law enforcement is um, is an awful or or a monster, you know, because they wear a uniform. I don't believe that at all. I believe that the good majority of us want to do right. Um, the issue is that when you witness these atrocities and you don't say anything, then you're a part of the problem. And for forever people, elected officials, uh, the community have been asking officers to report these officers uh, for these behaviors. And so it's made what we're doing. I don't think we would have the MOU in St. Louis County. Yeah, we had people that were pushing for it behind the scenes. We had a lot of elected officials and a lot of people who weren't elected officials pushing for that. But when uh, the chief of police says that there is no systemic racism in an environment where we're literally protesting because of systemic racism in law enforcement and we're protesting and you have a chief of police say that, and then in the same breath, she does exactly what we're talking about, excludes minorities um, from her committee. That was a problem. And I think it helped, the current environment helped with getting the MOU signed. It was important to have that, to have them in place. And it's made made it a little bit more easier um, for us, but it's, it's an uphill battle because we're talking about systemic racism and changing police culture. And police culture, um, it will eat policy and procedures every single day. The culture is what the problem is and that culture is both black, white, male, female, LGBTQ, you name it. If there is a human being in law enforcement, they're a problem. And they cross all, all different di um, demographics. There is no one that can uh, claim that this, first, this race or this group is better um, because collectively we've, we've caused most of the problems and we have to fix it. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, having the Army at your back sounds like it has helped propel the cause, but I have to imagine also that it has ramped up uh, the pushback as well. Am I wrong about that? No, you're not wrong about that. Okay. You have you have people who, who don't want to change, but I can tell you that in our department, what a lot of people don't know, we have a lot of people who are either being indicted or they're either uh, re retiring. And these some of these people have been here for decades and they have been a part of the problem. And to know that at this moment in law enforcement in the last month, we've had some people who have been here forever that have been a problem across all racial lines, all, uh, all genders, and they're leaving now. I think the writing is, it's good that the writing is on the wall. There's been a put, been pushed back, absolutely. You have the Police Officers Association. We can't deny uh, that their views are, are a little, they're pretty much different from ours. So you have that pushback that's going to be there to keep the old system in place, but you also have um, people seeing the writing is on the wall that it's time to leave. I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, Wesley, you ran for office essentially in response to a massive uprise in protest. Uh, so has the latest round of such uh, changed uh, the dynamic for you in your office? Uh, first and foremost, I gotta I gotta uh, correct something. That quote, the Plymouth Rock quote, that's from the great Malcolm X, ah. um, who who originally made that quote. Just gotta put that out there. Thank you. No, um, absolutely. Um, but speaking of him, he also said, "I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice, no matter who it's for or against. I'm a human being first and foremost, and as such, I'm for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole." And, um, and so when I look at protests and, and things that we're doing that, that are going on now, it does remind me of, of, 2000, of 2014. And, and you know, my, the front, I lived on South Florida, and so I could just look out the window and see protests constantly. But um, I, I, I will say that um, to have this point, um, there has to be a change in culture. And because um, what will happen is that, and, and I actually got an opportunity to speak to uh, the uh, new recruits, the cadets that just graduated from the police academy, and I was given instructions to not get political. And I just completely ignored that and I had no intention. <laughs> I, I was going to say what I was going to say. And, and essentially what the gist of what I was saying is, is that it's not about you individually. You might be a great guy or woman, 
but it's but there's a culture there and when you think about the people that are affected you know and 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 let's just give me and i'll make this quick i promise wally but just to do a quick exercise if you if if for an officer who says hey look there's no i've never done anything wrong to anyone why should you uh be upset with me let's go back to a time where we know we can agree everyone can agree in the 60s that policing um, um, was predatory when you look at Bull Connor um, fire hoses and dogs. So no one can dispute that, right? We won't even go to Rodney King. Let's just go there. Well, if you were 20 years old at that time, you're only 75 now. If you're in 65, you're only 75 now. And so we're talking about this is within living memory. And those individuals have children who were in their 50s. And they have, they have grandchildren who they've told their stories who are in their 30s and 20s. So when, when, when officers have to understand that when they encounter someone, it's not just about you, whether you seem like a nice person or, or, or not, but individuals have a reason, a justification for having anxiety, for having trauma, because those stories have been passed around. And we're not even talking about the things that, that they've experienced on their own. I was around uh, during 1992. And, and when we talk about being pulled over, and I, and, and I come from a unique perspective because my father is a retired sergeant, um, Atlanta Metro, so utmost respect for law enforcement. I know that that's the toughest job in the world, and I mean that literally, but also as a young black male, pulled over for no, no reason at all, sat on the curb, car searched so many times, and I've said this before, I didn't know there was anything wrong with it until I went to law school and, and took constitutional law, and I was like, hey, this that wasn't right and so i think that perspective helps me to uh serve in my role as referee if you will and i and i go to um uh, police departments we we tour all of them and i tell them flat out like there are reasons why people are upset with you there are things that need to that that you need to be aware of and be sensitive to and and if you want us at our office to treat you with customer service we're gonna we'll do that but you're gonna turn around and when you're out in that community treat people with customer service and so i couldn't ask to be in a, a better place it is tough it's difficult there's always issues coming up you're getting pulled from all different um in all different directions but i would rather myself i would rather heather i would rather lj i'd rather lisa clancy occupying these spaces um so that when so we're in the room where it happens and just be prepared you're gonna get some hamilton quotes i've watched it like four times in the last two days <laughs> but you need people like this progressive minded reform minded fair minded in these spaces making these decisions and i think we are heading in the right direction but we got a long way to go okay lisa i might i might move over to you uh since the inception of that protest uh, you know, you're sitting in a very, very powerful position of, as chair of the county council. Uh, I imagine getting pulled in lots of directions is something you identify with. Uh, and since those protests have happened, how has your job changed? You know, I think what I've seen change in the past couple of months and even, you know, in the 18 months that I've been on the St. Louis County Council is that we're seeing police reform and accountability moved to a more mainstream issue. Um, before it felt like, you know, in, in recent memory even, it felt like it was still sort of a fringe kind of topic. It was more progressive. And now it seems like there are more and more people, especially more and more people that look like me, white people who are um, not looking away and acknowledging um, this systemic inequality. And so that would, that's, that's the piece to me that I think feels the most different. I have, um, a lot of folders in my inbox right now. One of them is a folder um, that I've put all the emails I need to work my way through to respond to about this issue. And I've got, I've got 400 emails at least right now that I've received only in the past two weeks from um, people here in St. Louis and beyond who are asking for police reform and accountability. And that's more than I've ever received on the topic in the past 18 months. So that's what feels new to me. But I think a lot of the issues um, of systemic inequality aren't new. Um, they're part of why I raised my hand to run for this position. Um, and so, you know, I, um, so there's things that are new and things that are not new about it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I take that point that the 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 protests, uh, at least the level of them may be new and the national sense of urgency we're feeling are new, but the issues certainly aren't, as Wesley was pointing out, absolutely. Uh, speaking of newness, LJ, you really didn't even have a moment to get yourself settled in your seat there on the commission before all of this uh, really came down and the commission uh, was really kind of in a space to make some pretty momentous decisions. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about, even though you were reluctant to step into this space, it was the community that asked you to step into this space and suddenly the community's in an uproar. What did that mean for you? Well, um, you know, the, all of this is also happening in the setting of a global pandemic. And as a physician, um, my concern is that the trauma on top of the trauma uh, has made the transition of leadership in the county police department particularly challenging. We, we, we basically, even before the current situation around protesting work of time to try to have a new chief in position and literally finished our community listening sessions just a little bit before the time when basically we would have never we wouldn't have been able to have those sessions in that way so there is some anxiety and pressure uh, that was mounting even before and then after immediately after naming a new chief and having some hopes for discourse and plans we the department itself had to completely shift gears put a huge amount of energy into the command center which I think um, I think one thing I do want to say as a, again as a physician is how moved I was by the way in which the county police department did take the lead in in helping the county respond to the pandemic early on I don't think people even realize how much the department was helping the health department but aside from that there was just we had these ideas and plans and then all of a sudden everyone's on frozen basically because we have this whole new world of, of uh, pressure. So basically you have a brand new board, you have a brand new chief, and then I'm, all of a sudden all the normal mechanisms of communication were gone. And so it has been uh, very difficult to try to think about how to ask for change, ask for the fruition uh, of some of the things that we talked about in the chief search uh, to, to become to be. And it, it's hard because at the same time, there's even more an urgent need for those things to be because there is a lot of trauma right now. There is a high level of stress. Unfortunately, every trauma center in the region is breaking its records for gun violence again this year. And so um, I, this, this is a time and when we need precise, powerful, and visionary leadership. And I'm not gonna lie. And I have said this uh, uh, in, in different forms and I'm gonna say it right now. I am worried, I am worried that our current structure of leadership in the police department does not have a deep enough understanding of how much a grasp racism has on the practice of policing with a capital P and within the department itself. And I'm worried that there is not a structure for accountability that anywhere comes to what it should be when we're in work that involves life and death. As a physician, my behavior was scrutinized perpetually at a level that the police department doesn't begin to scrutinize publicly. There might be behaviors internally, but not publicly. So, I mean, you have tremendous burdens, tremendous stress, disrupted communication channels and processes and needs that are through the roof. So I, I'm not gonna, there's no, there's no reason to say this is roses and sunshine. This is a really hard time. My hope is that the pressure, that pressure will be the kind of coal to diamond pressure that we need to make the kind of changes. I was criticized when I was had my hearing for uh, coming onto the board 
for suggesting that systems of uh, inequality need to not just be reformed, but dismantled, even suggesting in a quote that sled a sledgehammer might be necessary. But I think the country is screaming for a sledgehammer right now. And I'm glad I said it. And I'm glad I feel that way because we can't just put a new coat of paint on this. We have to completely break down and renew in a very different way how we think about policing. Okay. LJ, I might actually stick with you. So what I'm gonna do here next is I'm gonna ask questions of each of you individually as opposed to all of you as a panel. Uh, so I've got some specific things I wanna get into and we can uh, have comments from the panel afterwards after I get through these four questions. I also wanna let the audience know uh, that in about 20 minutes, we're gonna to get to some audience questions, 20, 25 minutes, which you can go ahead and start putting into the chat. Uh, so that you can put, so that we can put those uh, to the uh, panelists. So LJ, I'm going to stick with you. Um, as you said, your entry onto the scene in St. Louis was as a medical professional, a trauma surgeon. Uh, through that lens, you became an outspoken activist on fighting violence in the St. Louis community. You create advanced community-based first response training. Um, and then all of a sudden you had this community call and ask from the halls of power to step into a role as a, as a police commissioner. Since that time, you've spoken about the fact that you hired a, a new police chief about whom you have some worries. Um, the county has also arranged for a privately funded review of policing by two nationally known former police chiefs. Um, you've talked about it has been difficult to understand the accountability, lines of accountability from that institution, inside of that institution, and although also from that institution up to uh, the county executive, the administration, the council, and of course, uh, the police commission. Can you give us a sense of what powers does the commission have? What what are the lines of accountability that you know of that end up with you uh, that, that the commission might be able to pull on to address some of these things? Because I think a lot of the public doesn't know exactly what role the commission has. So um, thank you for such a concise and easy question, Wally. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but let's, let me say this, first of all, the charter the charge of the commission, and you can see on the internet, you can go to the county uh, website um, and look at it. But if you look at the organizational structure, the hierarchy, if you will, of the police department, the chief is responsible and reports to and works under, right, the guidance of the police board. So there's a pillar there and then pff, there's this broad, huge structure that's underneath the chief. And so there is a significant point of influence through the chief, and yet it's a very narrow point to pivot on. And so what I have found to be challenging, right, is the way in which you, we do the job as commissioners that engage the department beyond the chief because it's really not possible, right, to simply have this unilateral relationship and not be informed by the people whose lives and work and energy is gonna be deeply impacted by whatever we suggest and say. So one of the things that I've come to realize is the job of the commissioner is the job you make it to be. You can spend as much or as little time as you want. That's a problem. That's a problem. I think, I think some of the challenges that occurred with the prior board um, might in part be due to the fact that it is so wildly up to interpretation how you fulfill your position. Mm -hmm. And you can spend as much time, have as many conversations. They open the department up to you. They have been wonderful in giving me access, providing communication channels, but that takes time. That takes energy. And and that's a big part of it. So in one way, the power is totally limited by this five person board. So, you know, you're only 20%, right? Of the input as an individual. And then that, that point of contact is to the chief. And then if you really wanna be part of the system, you have to go way past that, spend way more time. 
and 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 so there's both there's there's only as much power as you take mm -hmm. and i think that is something I, in full transparency i'm struggling with because it has only been but a few months and i'm trying to figure out where to focus my energies and i have asked i basically told myself listen you either have to spend a lot more time on this position or you have to let somebody else do it because um it's just it's just too easy to roll with it and and, and i don't want to do that and so some of the areas that i'm thinking a lot about are the diversity and inclusion efforts are the efforts that are going along around in human resources the recruitment efforts and um, some other real detailed nitty gritty stuff about policy, which I can talk about more later or in a different form. But uh, long story short, the job is what you make it. And, and um, that's actually, that's challenging. I think that's a really important insight. And thank you for an extremely concise uh, uh, answer uh, to, to uh, what was a mess of a question. Um, I don't think people realize the degree to which the power grasped in any particular public position is up to the individual who sits in that position. Um, and, and I think that's a really important point. Thank you for making that. Absolutely. Um, Lisa, I think I will, I will come to you next. Um, the speed of your path from county council candidate to chair of the county council uh, is matched perhaps only by the momentousness of the occasions, the events that roiled uh, the county environment during that time, from the federal indictment of the sitting executive uh, uh, to, the, uh, to um, uh, the, the systemic racism, uh, the uproar, the, the pandemic. All of that has happened at once while you were stepping into this new role um, as the council chair. Can, I'd like to know from you, um, can you talk about a little bit more about what it's meant to have such a central role during these tumultuous times as a new elected official and specifically to make the question even harder, as a white official, a white leader who wants to do something on racial equity while working inside of a predominantly white institution that has traditionally pr protected the status quo of inequity, if I'm not saying something too terribly controversial. Uh, really difficult question for you, Lisa, but, uh, but I'm guessing something you've been struggling with. So if you could talk about it a little bit, that'd be great. Yes, um, softball question. No, no it's not. <laughs> um, so, I mean, if I'm being really honest about what it's like to be a leader right now, it means I'm tired, I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, you know, my kid is sick of me being on phone calls all the time. Um, you know, but no, really, I mean, it's, it's a lot. Um, and I, you know, I want to go back to something I said earlier. I don't think that the issues that, that we are facing right now are surprises. They're not, you know, it, this is not, um, I mean, I think the way that they're manifesting is not something that um, at least I was able to predict or see when I looked into my crystal ball, but um, it, to some extent, I think I knew what I was signing up for when I decided to run for this position and when I became council chair. Um, so I think, you know, there's, there's been some aspects of this that have been a learning curve because I am new in this role, but I think that um, part of being a strong leader is always embracing learning. And so that's also something that I think I expected. Um, and, you know, again, to the fact that this isn't something new, um, every crisis facing our community and beyond right now, um, I think is born of the same root and that root is, is deep seated and baked in inequality. It's a system that favors white people, it favors wealthy people, it favors people who are cisgender and heterosexual and Christian um, and leaves scraps for everyone else. And, and that's something that I'm committed to, to changing and, and taking a sledgehammer to, just like Punch said. Um, but I think the difference between the roles I've been in prior um, to this moment um, and where I am now is that I have, um, is sort of my how looks different. I have more power and more tools um, and levers right in front of me that I can activate. And, and that's something I think about every single day. Um, so to kind of get to your next piece of the question, what's it like to be a, um, a white leader who wants to do the right thing on racial equity as if it's that simple, the right thing, um, you know, while working inside of a predominantly white 
status quo upholding institution, um, you know, if we're if we're getting brave and vulnerable, which I think we are, it it means that I um, I have to be honest and say that it's not always comfortable. But I hope that that's a sign that I'm doing the work that I know I need to do to stand for change and to stand for the kind of change that makes our region a place where everyone can live their best lives. I am acutely aware that I am a white woman, that I benefit from the very systems and structures that I am calling to task and asking to change. Um, so I know that I have to make sure that there's accountability for myself. Um, and that, for me, that means a lot of learning constant learning, constant reading, constant engaging with people who've had very different lived experiences than I have had. That kind of expertise is so important and is often not valued as the kind of expertise that we need to have at all of the decision-making tables. Um, so I need, I need to check my, my blind spots and I need to call in people and I'm lucky to have so many people in my life, friends, family, mentors who are not afraid to, to call me in and help check me um, when they see that I have some blind spots that are perhaps um, serving as a threat to that which I'm seeking to change. Um, and I think it also means being vigilant about when I step up and when I step back. Um, I have to listen, I think, as I mentioned before, constantly listening to people who've had different experiences than I have had. And often, in order to be able to listen to those experiences, I have to be part of creating opportunities to hear those experiences. Um, so that's all that's on my mind with, with all of the questions that you asked. <laughs> I think I really appreciate that point about about it being a responsibility not just to listen but actually create opportunities for you to listen that is a really important second step that addresses the underlying systematic issue of the fact that even if you want to listen if you just use the avenues that are that are available to you in an institution as it was when you came to it those opportunities aren't going to be there and you have to create that so i appreciate that um, Heather, I know that you have to leave us in, in a few minutes, so I'm going to turn to you. I'm actually um, here until, um, I guess, about 40 after. Okay, excellent. All right, fantastic. Well, I appreciate you spending all the time you can with us. Um, and what I'd like to ask is that, um, you know, the, the, the Ethical Society has uh, supported police officers and it has also stood up and not only published uh, information about the inner workings of the SLMPD. I mean, your all's comprehensive report that you put out, I, uh, how many years ago that, that now, is still something that I go back and reference, but also name names in terms of those associated with S SLMPD or affiliated unions that you see as operating in bad faith. I would like, if it's possible for you to give the audience a sense of what it has cost you professionally and what you have been subjected to professionally for standing up and speaking. I hate to talk about this. My goodness. I, I, I I'm sorry, and I, we can uh, skip it. I'm I don't sorry, want to re-traumatize but... <laughs> you. That's the last thing I want to do. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it, it comes with it. And, you know, there are people who have lost their lives um, um, fighting for our freedom. Um, you know, you have Dr. King, Malcolm X. You have so many leaders um, that have died. So, you know, who am I to um, complain about what's happening. Uh, does it hurt? Yeah, absolutely, it hurts. You know, I have a husband, I have a stepson, I have family, I have a father, mother who love me. Um, you know, to, you know, when your father who is, you know, 80 years old now, and when your father cries because he's afraid for your life, you know, that's real. And it's angry, you know, it's very angry. Um, but, you know, those things are, it's real, it comes with it. You know, we're about to um, address, um, the 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 revised state statute you know um 84.344 which essentially in 2013 and placed us under local control which means that we were bef before that we were under state control for those that don't know and there was a, a, a statewide vote that said hey the police department the city of st louis should control the police department and within the city, there is something called the city charter, which is essentially the Bible of the rules and your regulations. You follow it. That's, you know, it's in there. And under that, you have Article 18, which is the um, 
personnel division and you know civil service rules and basically SLMPD hasn't followed those rules until Chief Hayden, uh, essentially. So right now, what we have going on is that, yeah, Chief Hayden has done some some good things. You know, we've disagreed with him as well. <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, we feel that when the next chief comes in, who's going to be that person? And when Hayden retires, who's going to be that person? Are they going to go back to the old way? So we have a chief now following the rules, but the reality is, is that we should have followed the law. It's the law. You know, we have, we are literally breaking the law and, you know, nobody's really up in arms about it because they don't know. So that's the next step. And we are expecting, you know, people to come after us because of that. So we're preparing an executive summary uh, to be released on our police department again and, and to address those things. And with that, you know, it's going to be, you're going to face scrutiny uh, the last time we did it. Uh, we, it, one person in particular in the media came after us and they were wrong. Uh, we fought, 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 and it comes with it. So, you know, uh, we're about to do the same thing again, about to go through the same process, but I'm at the tail end of my career where, you know, I'm going to leave out. But, you know, when you talk about it, you have to do what you have to do. If it's the right thing to do, you do it. And with it comes with it is, and, you know, I don't want my, my 80 year old father crying um, mm -hmm. or upset or my mother wondering, you know, if someone's going to try to harm me or, you know, no, I don't want her to hear messages of, of, of racist rants from community, people in the community that have called and, and said some of the most appalling things ever. Um, but, you know, even with that, uh, what my mother and father have taught me with this fight uh, with trying to be fair and equality is that you fight back and you have to keep fighting back if it's right. Um, so, you know, who am I um, to complain about what's happening? Uh, it's difficult, but you do it because it's the right thing and we're about to do it again. And it'll probably, <laughs> it won't, I'm sure a lot of people in the city won't like it and, you know, but it's the law. So we're going to force um, force their hand, either they're going to listen or they're not. We'll just keep fighting. Wow. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing. Uh, I guess I, I know that's, that's tough. I just want folks to understand how difficult it is to be, to sit in some of these spaces that you all are sitting. So I appreciate that. Um, Wesley, I'm going to move on to you for this last question. Um, you've been in office uh, now uh, for a few years. Um, and I know you consider yourselves, yourself deeply accountable to those who have called for change and elected you. I also know that you're one person inside of a deep uh, and well-seated uh, criminal justice system um, that is difficult to take a sledgehammer to, uh, right? Um, while simultaneously trying to keep prosecutorial justice running as smoothly as possible. Can you give us some examples of how you'd have, you've had to balance, um, you know, what's what you want versus what's possible? Show your receipts for change while also making, while also uh, kind of having to balance against, I can't go there right now because it's going to blow everything else up that I'm trying to do. Like, how do you pick your battles? What are some of those kind of choices you've had to make? Well, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, uh, you know, was when, when I came in the office, um, you know, you get a lot of advice and, and some good advice, some not as good. And a couple people told me, hey, you know, um, ease in, get the lay of the land and, and then start uh, pushing some of the more uh, uh, bolder uh, agenda items. And so I decided to wait um, like a couple hours and so <laughs> on day one, uh, we implemented um, a lot of the sweeping changes that, um, um, that, we, that we have implemented, implemented in this office, I should say, uh, because I wanted, I thought that it was important to set a tone early, not only for the office, for the, because in, as, uh, as Lisa knows, uh, with civil service rules, you can't just clear house. Um, you have to have cause to, to, to remove people. And so 
and but also I want to give them a chance to see how they operated under new management, if you will. And so, but I, I didn't want to um, let the old policies linger because keep in mind, they're not just policies, they're people. They represent people who are being charged with crime, sometimes uh, justly, sometimes unjustly, but these are people that are um, in our prisons. Uh, and I just thought, and I thought it was important that we shock the system um, a little bit and 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 come right in and and also externally um, on the outside. I think it sends a message that um, you know these reforms, these things that people voted myself in and as well as uh, Councilwoman Clancy, um, that that we're hearing them and that we're not just talking. I, I think historically we've heard that we know the notion of politicians who get in office and and don't do anything and don't keep their promises. And, um, and, and I was determined not to be that guy. Um, I just think that, um, I just think that it's important um, to do what you say and, and say what you do. And, and, um, and, and, and one thing that I'll say is um, for the most part, and, 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 I, and, and I talked to a good friend of mine, Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore and, and um, uh, a couple people gave me some good advice. And they say, you know, it takes a good year to start seeing that, that change in culture within the office. And, um, and, and I can honestly say, yeah, there's still some people that I'm, I'm watching, um, but the, there's been a culture change. When you look at the policies that we've implemented, expanding diversion, you know, when I came in office, there were several people in the office saying behind my back, oh, well, he's just worried about the defendants. Matter of fact, someone even said it at one of our training sessions. I brought in an author um, who wrote a book on criminal justice reform. And one of the questions asked of the author is, well, it sounds like we're just focusing on the defendants. And, and you know, my response was, is, well, if you look at the, the, the numbers, if you look at your caseloads, many of your defendants are also victims. We're talking oftentimes the same pool of people. Um, and, and when we stop looking at them as, when we stop otherizing people and understanding that all we're asking for, when we talk about criminal justice reform, when we talk about um, reform in general, is that all people are asking are is a fair shake. Just be fair. You do not hear people on the street saying, treat us better, treat us better. They're not doing that. They're saying simply, treat us with the same rights that you expect um, that, that you expect for yourselves. We have people who were enslaved, who, who were born and died slaves. And, 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 and then we have to look at, and then we hear, hear people get all up, up, upset about Confederate monuments coming down that represent people who were lived and died as slaves. I just, Sometimes we, we think of these people as, as, as characters in a book, but these were, this was your mom, your grandmother, your sister, your brother. These were real people who had to live as slaves. And, and now we fast forward to um, our modern day slave system, if you will, which is our criminal, has been our criminal justice system. Matter of fact, the 13th Amendment says that if someone is um, in prison, that, that, um, that it doesn't apply to them. And, and so those, those individuals often don't have voices. There's not, there's not as many people that are gonna get up and go to Jeff City and advocate for prisoners. And so we created our, our, con integri our conviction integrity unit because if we're gonna have the right to put people in jail, well, we gotta have the right to make sure there's safeguards in place to, to ensure that we're, we're not, we're get, we have the right person. And, if, and what prosecutor's offices don't do, and I'll close on this, what prosecutor's offices often do is that they serve as, as, um, as um, speed bumps to slow down these kind of investigations. And so our philosophy is no, if, if there is a credible allegation, we're going to not only um, uh, be supportive of that, of that investigation, we're gonna lead that investigation. And I'm proud to say in just a few months, we, we released the first individual who's wrong, wrongfully convicted, Mr. Callanan, who had served about uh, 18 years, but that that just that that um, invest that um, prosecution was was eth unethical to say the least, but and criminalist to 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 call it what it was. 
Uh, thank you, uh, and thanks, thanks to all of you uh, for that. Because uh, I think we got into some um, some spaces that I think people don't hear from public office holders a lot of times. Um, so at this point, I want to ask one more question, and then I'm seeing some trends in the questions from the audience. We're going to bring those. But there is a phrase which has been bouncing around the national atmosphere, uh, uh, AKA defund the police, uh, which has provoked a lot of reaction, pro, anti, people deciding they know what it means for other people. Um, and given that uh, you all are sitting in positions of power or in, uh, in the police force, I'd just like to ask you to give me a response when you hear protesters or when you hear advocates saying defund the police. Um, what does it mean to you and what is your reaction? And Heather, I might go ahead and start with you, first of all, because you're sitting uh, in the, you're on the police force. And also, I know you're probably going to have to leave soon. I wanted to get your reaction to that. I think that it, it specifically means that you're reallocating things that um, your resources there. A lot of resources are spent on police officers and, and things that really aren't police matters. Mental health calls really aren't police matters, uh, especially if there's no threat of um, someone being harmed. Uh, we're responding on that for years and years and years. We've wanted officers to be something that we're not. And we're putting them in these spaces that we are the worst case scenarios for a social worker. We aren't. We really just aren't. You know, we don't have a four-year degree in, in training in, in that, and it, that's necessary. And, you know, if we're talking about reallocating resources, let's go ahead and put this money towards uh, crisis um, response centers and, and cure violence and things that are really, really necessary. Mental health, uh, putting money into uh, rehabilitation, um, creating more jobs, and stop having officers respond on things that are custody um, exchanges. That's not our business. It's not our business. We shouldn't be responding on uh, accidents. There are accidents for a reason. Uh, there's no need for officers to be on a lot of these calls that we get calls for uh, fire hydrants. Uh, you know, come on. These are city resources. That's pay people to do these jobs that we haven't traditionally paid to do them. So um, we had um, someone mention hiring the legislator and mentioned hiring 30 um, officers and training them in, in um, crisis intervention training and having these, how about we just hire 30 social workers? Let's just, let's just do some things that really help like having social workers work with juveniles. And when we have had as a detective that was assigned at one short moment in my career in juvenile, I really utilize social workers and suddenly they disappeared and they have resources and they talk to families and were able to get um, things resolved that I had no business involved in and I had no skills to resolve. So it's important for us to reallocate these resources to the people and start paying people who should be doing these jobs, not law enforcement officers, because we have been trained for decades and decades and decades to be warriors, not guardians. We're not guarding anything for the most part now. It's sad, but it's reality. Let's stop having us do these jobs. And that's what I think defunding is. And that's how it's been explained to me. And if you start talking about abolishing the police, you're going to lose a lot of your voice there. Uh, when people talk about that, I understand the sentiment uh, of it. But a lot of times people they're not willing to go that far. We're not there yet. We are at the step of let's reallocate some of these resources and stop giving police officers more money to, to damage cars, more guns, uh, more ability to, to shoot and run and do things that uh, we really shouldn't be doing. Thank you. Um, the really interesting response to this question from someone sitting uh, inside the police uh, uh, institution as an officer. Uh, and I've been corrected. I appreciate that. Defund the police is not a phrase that's floating around. It is a movement. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Definitely something uh, that a lot of folks are getting behind. So I, I, I would ask the other panelists who would like to weigh in. What is your response uh, to that idea uh, of defunding the police? I'll go. Lisa. Um, I, I know 
a lot of people I think have gotten hung up on sort of the name, the defund the police. And, and I've tried to spend a little bit, of, a lot of time actually getting past that part and trying to really hear and listen and understand about what it, what it means when people say that. And, you know, what I hear is very similar to what, what Heather just said. It is about investing resources upstream so that we prevent and get at, um, the things that cause crime in the first place and cause violence in the first place. And um, as a as a social worker and someone who particularly has spent a lot of time thinking about systems, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, that's about prevention. There's a lot of evidence about um, upstream investments we need to make um, to make sure that people's needs are met and how that is, is then associated with positive outcomes when it comes to community safety. So um, I am, I am, this is something that is, is uh, getting some attention of mine and I hope will um, uh, get the attention of some of my other colleagues on the county council because we are going to be diving in very soon to our own county budget and um, you know, I hope that this is something that we're thinking about um, when it comes to balancing our budget, not just in terms of dollars and cents, but in, in balancing our budget from a prevention standpoint and from a public health standpoint. Um, because when I hear about crime taking place, I don't always, I mean, I think about the victim, I think about the perpetrator, but I also think about systems failures. Um, and I think ultimately, again, when we invest resources upstream, we are giving police officers and the courts less to respond to. And I think that that is a very powerful way to support, to support them. Um, so I appreciate I, the reframe of defund the police as a way to support the police. Uh, because absolutely. essentially, as you and Heather were saying, it's about taking things off their plate that they are not necessarily best equipped to deal with that we've been burdening them with because of a lack of other systems. Right. And, and in that, when you take less off their plate, that to me also, I think, translates probably into it, it doesn't cost as much to police. And so, um, you know, this was something that came up in our hearing a few weeks ago with our police chief, who when I asked her sort of what her reactions to that were, I think we were at different levels of, of understanding what that movement is calling for. But I think, um, you know, the chief said, well, not if it means that we're taking away resources from the police. And, and to me, again, there's a, you know, there's an analysis about you know, if police are responding to less, then again, it, it probably costs them less. So again, let's, let's invest these resources where um, we know they're going to people and their health. Thank you. Uh, and I, I see in the, in the uh, uh, comments there someone uh, with my came with my favorite phrase, a budget is a moral document, uh, right? It, it shows your priorities and shows your values. So thinking about this from the budget end is important. Wesley, I'm imagining uh, your bud office budget has undergone some uh, examination in the time you've been there. How do you feel when we talk about defunding the police? Or if you wanna talk a little bit more about what you've done the budget in your office, I, I, yeah, I'd appreciate that as well. And, and I, I kind of want to start with, with law enforcement in general, and it reminds me of, of The Wire, uh, with, when Colvin says that the war on drugs ruined the job because it created a warrior mentality. And if you're going to be in a war, now you have to have an enemy. And now many of our, especially our, our poor and disenfranchised neighborhoods, um, become war zones and, and they become occupying forces and um, and that leads more directly, I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically to a certain extent, but that leads to more aggressive policing and, and all of the things that come with that. And then let's add cutting uh, as a society across the country, cutting healthcare. And, and, and so now we have less places to take individuals. So an officer who's already not trained to be a social worker now is dealing with someone where they don't have um, access to adequate health quick health care so where do i take them and just as a plug on on and on august uh, august 8th is the election you get an opportunity to vote on medicaid expansion but I'll, I'll leave that alone although you heard me and also we cut mental health care as well and so um that is one of my mantras that defund that uh your budgetary decisions reflect your values and so what, what we did when we came in the office was we did a comparative analysis of all of all of the uh, of all of the uh, similar prosecu prosecutor off prosecu prosecutors offices and DA offices around the country. Our office is one of the most underfunded of all of the offices in, in the country. 
However, so what that means is we're already running, running behind and we already have higher caseloads than we should. However, we talked about diversion. We know that close to 80% of individuals need substance use care or mental health care. So if we're not gonna get the money, that means we're gonna have to move people from positions to other positions. But that's, those are my values. Those are our values. And so we did that. My predecessor had one part-time person who also had a murder, had homicides on their docket doing all of the diversion programs. And so you had a total of about 150 people in diversion. And this is a county of a million. We were the lowest operating diversion program in the, in the state behind the boot hill with their 60,000 people. Well, now we've moved, uh, we have that, that we've expanded that unit to four individuals and counting. We also had started a conviction integrity unit. I talked about that and how important it was. We didn't have any budget for that. We pulled and from another unit and we created our budgetary, our, our, uh, our uh, uh, conv conviction incident unit. And now, and now it will have three people in it. And that's three people we had to take from other places, but that's important. We created a data analyst. We had to take another position and create that position because if you are not tracking your data, you cannot prove what, if what you're saying is in fact working or true. So that was important for us. And, um, and then we also created a community engagement uh, department. And so, uh, cause, because I think that it's important when we, get, when we learn our lessons from Ferguson and and even before that, that it's important that we are connecting with our, our community, that we are hearing those individuals. And so it was important for us to create those positions because again, those are the values which I ran on and which I believe in. And um, when we look at um, the 30% the, the, the decrease in the jail population since we came in, into office, what we've noticed so far, knock on wood, not one individual that we've had in our diversion program has, um, has reoffended. Now, the odds are that's going to happen, we know that. But the premise and the data showed us that when people get the services that they need, they get the mental health care that they need, they get the substance use um, treatment that they need, they are significantly less likely to reoffend. And yes, our recidivism rate won't stay at zero for that population, but it is much lower than the 85% recidivism rate across the country. Thank you for that. Um, we, are, we are getting close to time. LJ, did you want to weigh in on uh, and add anything to what's been said about the defund the police thing? I want to make sure that we have some time uh, for audience questions here at the end. Just quickly, I'd amplify everything everyone said. When I hear defund the police, what I hear uh, in my mind as a metaphor is defund the hospital, meaning put energy into preventing the problem rather than being satisfied with treating it when it becomes a life and death issue. It makes sense that people react negatively to the idea of defunding police because the need is so great, but that's simply because we have decided to allow bodies of people to not have what they need, which causes the need for the police. So I really hear a sort of reordering of priorities that's much more focused on prevention. The problem is black bodies are disproportionately the subject of police activity. We have got to see that, deal with it, and think very creatively about why we have allowed need in the population of black folks to be called crime and and other populations allowing it to be called what it is, which is need. And so mm -hmm. for me, what I hear is a much, a call to a very rich nuanced conversation. And it gets back to that picture you showed in the beginning. We, we shouldn't allow it to polarize us. We should mm -hmm. allow it to draw us into deep contemplation of what it could mean to focus on everyone being well and prevention and not just reacting to what we call a crime. And, wow. and can I add, can I interject? Wally, um, and I think to uh, um, Dr. Punch's point, and Dr. Punch is so cool. I mean, who else can make hand washing like a thing and just super cool? Uh, but, you know, I, th I think to further illustrate that point is when we look at the opiate epidemic, and, and don't get me wrong, there are people struggling and dying from this epidemic, but um, it didn't become a problem until it hit our more affluent communities. The crack and heroin 
uh, plagued our communities for generations, we are still feeling the, the ill effects of that epidemic and it was not treated the same. But so often people can only see beyond, people can't see beyond their circumstances. And so, yes, we use that as an opportunity um, to, to, to promote our diversion programs because we knew, we knew that certain communities already understood. But now we knew we had a captive audience with communities that generally won't get this type of, don't get this type of issue. And so I, that was one of the ways that we, that one of the, 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 the drivers behind us being able to, uh, to, to broadly and aggressively expand our diversion programs, just like that uh, is happening in the city uh, with the circuit attorney Gardner as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at questions from the audience and I'm seeing uh, one powerful theme, which is the audience wants to know not just what are you doing, but how can they support you? Um, and I like there's a specific point made about, about the fact that uh, LJ, as you get brought into this conversation from the perspective of a healthcare uh, professional, kind of using that interdisciplinary voice, busting out of those silos to step into the space of policing, to step into the space of criminal justice, and to understand it as something that's connected to all of these other things. Uh, so just like to hear from all of you uh, to the audience, what can the audience do? What support do you need from the community in order to continue and advance this work? Who wants to pick that one up? You know, I'll, I'll jump in. I thought that was for Dr. Punch. That's why I was staying, um, 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 being quiet. Um, you know, I, I, th that's a tough question. So I, I'll start by saying this. Um, personally, my, my, my visceral reaction to that question is to say, um, we need your voices to continue, continue to be um, um, heard um, and not just at election time. It, it's, mm -hmm. We get a lot of hits from, um, um, and, 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 I, and you know, it's interesting, we get more hits from not law enforcement, but the FOP. And when we talk about diversion programs, I mean, these things are supported by data. They're supported by research. And, and yet, when we, when we say, hey, instead of incarcerating this nonviolent, low-level offender, why don't we give them the treat? Why don't we give them treatment because they're less likely to reoffend? Well, we're called soft on crime, and and the, and we're told that oh, we're just letting everyone out, um, and and so having those voices at the council meeting supporting uh, Councilwoman Clancy, um, um, even even Dr. Punch in, in her role, so that 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 narrative is off is still voiced, so that people know that. The, the, the way that we've operated business as usual, that, that, that's not, that there are people who are saying enough of that. So at some point, as we start to get back into some type of normalcy, our new normal, I just think it's important that, that, that we know that those, those advocates are out there, those, uh, those reform advocates, those progressive-minded people, and that they're selling that narrative to the people who don't necessarily um, aren't as aren't as open to it or maybe just don't know because generally when people hear um, the facts and they hear the why behind these policies they get on board but we need more community advocates pushing that narrative. Okay. So community advocates give you the power and the freedom to make changes uh, and, and, and push back against the kind of status quo. Okay. Anybody else, uh, Lisa, LJ, you want to weigh in on that? What what can the public do to support you, help you, help move these things forward? I'll chime in. Um, this has been a really great conversation. Um, so I think to add sort of to what um, what Wesley said, you know, I don't think it's that hard. Yes, show up, pay attention in between election cycles. Um, think about 
I think that I spent a lot of time thinking about power and what it looks like in various places. I think we all have power. And I think we all need to think about the, the spheres of influence um, in our everyday lives that we operate in and think about how what it looks like to exercise power within those spheres of influence in a way that moves the needle towards equity and justice in our region. Um, and the other thing that comes to mind too about a way to support us is to to support each other in our community as neighbors. Our jobs are easier when we all treat each other with love and respect. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here um, when I think about the people that are on this, this uh, event tonight, but um, you know, that's something that we can all do. And part of that includes right now in this moment, wear a mask if you must go out. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we had to wear a mask. Excellent. Uh, yes, I appreciate that. Um, LJ, I know you're somebody who's, whose work in St. Louis was kind of centered around empowering community to help when violence struck their struck uh, in their neighborhood. Uh, so if you would love to hear you talk about that and what folks can do in community in that sense. Yeah, I, I do think there is a lot of opportunity to help um, especially our youth uh, have the chance to make a choice not to be victim or perpetrator, but instead to be helper. I, I think we talk so much about how we want people to act and we don't give them active and strong opportunities to be community. And so I think, I think there are some, some really neat opportunities there and I'm going to continue to work on them rigorously out of my center on, on Del Mar and as a Ferguson resident. Um, I would say when it comes specifically to, to policing, um, we need an ongoing clear voice from the community. When you don't like what happens, when you don't like what's going on, when you're concerned, when you think things should be different, I don't see enough people at the board of commissioners meetings, even on Zoom. I don't hear enough discourse. I don't feel enough pressure. Uh, I have done things that I don't think are perfect already on the commission. I have made mistakes and I need to hear about them so that we can do better. I, again, in medicine, this is up for grabs. You talk about it when you mess up and you do better. I think policing needs to be blown open in the same kind of discourse happen. The culture of secrecy is not good. It is a prime example of white body supremacy and we can't live this way anymore. And so I really need people to be vocal, verbal, present, um, cause I need help. And I will continue to play the role uh, and, and do it my best. But I, I, it's become very clear to me that I can't do it by myself. And, and, and that is against the culture of how this is supposed to work. You're not supposed mm -hmm. to talk about it. I'm not supposed to be saying these things right now. I, it was a huge deal in a board meeting just for me to ask a question. I could tell I was breaking decorum by asking a question in the first, meet, first meeting I was in. But this is the kind of thing we've got to do to open it up and to allow new life into it and to bring change. I'm not perfect. Uh, and and I, like I said, I admit that I've made some mistakes, but I want to learn and grow and do better. And I need help to be able to do that. If I may, Wally, um, Punch, isn't there a police commission meeting tomorrow? Why, Lisa, there is. <laughs> <laughs> How can we tune into that? <laughs> so um, it's kind of interesting because even I have the announcement as a PDF, but if you go to, so you kind of have to like, it's a little, you can't just push the button. So you gotta do some work. But if you go to the county police department and you go to the who we are, you'll see the board of commissioners website, uh, part of the website. And there's a page that has minutes and meetings and the announcement for the meeting is there. Um, sometimes it's a little weird. You might have to use Internet Explorer versus Google Chrome or whatever to get there. Um, and if it would serve the group, uh, Wally, I'm happy to, pass that to you so you could pass it to everybody. Maybe I'll even type it out so it's a little bit easier. But yeah, you, you can join. Please join. Uh, we actually have a lot of things on the docket tomorrow. I'm really excited because the commission has done some really deep uh, thinking and, and has, has opened up 
our next board meeting to a lot of voices and it's it's representative oh thank you boom I think I just pulled that from my calendar, so I hope that oh, wasn't some maybe. sort of exclusive link. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but but I really think the board is 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 in the other commissioners commissioners whom I deeply respect are really uh, doing the work too. Uh, it, again, I'm 20 percent. That's not even an F minus, right? I'm 20 percent of the effort, but we all got to just do our best. We've actually answered another question that we have from panelists, which is how do I become a community advocate? And I think we've just given folks a few avenues and pathways at the very least in terms of showing up and even some specific links uh, to this. So um, I, we have just a couple of minutes left um, and I would like to just go ahead and open this up uh, to the panelists. As we move forward uh, and we think about um, what this fall is going to bring us from who knows what the pandemic looks like, who knows what uh, the you know, level of pressure the, uh, the protests maintain, um, what, what would you like uh, the audience to, to be paying attention to? What are next steps? What do we need to be thinking about in terms of carrying this change-making uh, wave that we're seeing forward? I wanna give an example of the level of engagement that I wanna see around policy. There has been a call for a study. Um, the, the, the nature of that study is not um, something that I am aware of because I was in zero way engaged on the decision to do that study, just understand that. But uh, I will say that um, one of the things, for instance, I've been told that the county has already completely embraced the eight can't wait campaign. It's been tweeted to me that the county's completely compliant with it. It's been told to me in live meetings, but I've been going through some of the policies and I have found so many examples where culture and interpretation can absolutely wipe out the power of the A can't wait. For instance, the language around the issue of um, uh, comprehensive reporting uses the word that if someone believes excessive force has been used, then they should report. Those two words, believe and excessive, are open to wild amount of interpretation. I want to see, if we're going to do a study, if we're going to do some work, I want to see us get down to that level. What does that mean to our officers? How have we used that language before? And how does that manifest in the way that we do reporting within our department? That's the kind of discourse I want to see, a nuanced and rich and deep discourse that doesn't simply float on the top and say, yeah, we're good, but says, what is the way in which we're carrying out the spirit of the laws that we have in our department. And I think that echoes the point you made earlier about we can interpret how much power we have to a certain degree. Uh, you know, the fact that these former police chiefs are coming in to do this review, I don't know how many reviews of the police we can do before we actually start acting on the recommendations that the reviews put out. Um, but a review can be something more powerful if there's enough public pressure to make sure that it's substantive, that it comes up with action items and not just, uh, uh, yes, you've complied with eight, can't wait. Uh, yeah, and, that, and specifically gets down to that kind of difficult language. And that requires work from the public. All right, that requires them to understand issues in a more complex and, new, complex and nuanced way. So I think one of the things you can do to become a public advocate is educate yourself uh, uh, on some of these levels. The eight can't wait, there's also different versions of it floating around out there. So which one of them are we in compliance with? Uh, there's a lot of nuance and nuance in these uh, discussions and the idea of the public pressure being what pushes that nuance either in a kind of platitude direction or an actual digging into the into the issues direction, I think that's a good point. Uh, Lisa and Wesley, any final thoughts on this? Oh, what Is looks like we're actually or? out of time, but no. let's let's give you no, let's let's give you I want to give you a chance to to finalize some thoughts on that, Wesley, after you. 
you know, I, I, I want to say that um, um, when the, 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 what I saw uh, with George Floyd, it still haunts me. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of, for a lot of African Americans, this has been an issue that we've been complaining about for generations. I mean, you can go back and look at Richard Pryor videos and he was talking about this type of stuff and, and beyond. And, and, um, and so I, I, want pe I want people to understand the trauma that, um, um, that exists for so many people. And, and I'm the prosecutor and I still, my heart beats a little bit when an officer gets behind me, even, even now it's, 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 in, it's ingrained in my DNA at this, at this point, you know, even at this point, I know nothing's going to happen. At least I don't think, I hope, I pray, but, um, but even as the prosecutor, those thoughts go through my mind. Um, but I do want to say that out of tragedy comes an opportunity, comes opportunity quite often. And I do want to say that, um, and a quick, quick, quick um, analogy. I was eight years old. These two, these two boys were, were going to jump me. And uh, my buddy Ken, or my buddy, yeah, one of my buddies, I, he showed up at the last second. And, and I just remember how not only relieved I was, but just knowing someone had my back. And when I look at the diversity of the protests now, um, it doesn't feel like we're alone in this fight anymore because that's how it felt before. When, when, when we see people from all backgrounds and all races um, standing up and saying, this will not be tolerated, um, it, it doesn't take away the, the, the history that we dealt with. Because you know, some will say like, why did it take so long? But at the same time, it is, um, it, it, it is reassuring to know that, that Americans have my back and that this is not just a black problem anymore. This is an, Af this is an American problem because Americans are stepping up to say um, that this, this, these types of actions won't be tolerated. And so um, it doesn't bring back George Floyd. Um, we can't do that, but what we can do is move that needle forward and, um, and, and change and address the culture and the racism in our systems. Thank you for that. Lisa, tough act to follow. If you have any yeah. other final thoughts. Um, we've got, we've got a lot of work to do ahead. And I, I want people to understand that this work here in St. Louis and beyond for equity and justice is going to be a marathon. Um, perhaps a marathon relay, in fact, not a sprint. We need to sustain ourselves and fuel ourselves and take care of ourselves for the long run. And I am immensely grateful for everyone right now, um, particularly young people, young black residents who have kept me on my toes in this position, who've kept my colleagues on our toes and who are what I hear pushing us as a region to be better and to really live up to everything that we, that we aspire to. Um, and I want that to continue. So we need to continue to take care of each other and, and um, stay fueled for the long run. All right. On that note, I'm going to wrap this up. It has been an immense uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, to moderate a conversation with all of you. Thank you very much for joining me. This is a recorded conversation and will be available on uh, the Focus's YouTube channel. Uh, but thank you all. Thanks to the audience for showing up and thanks to everybody out there who is pushing for change. We need it. It's a long haul. Keep yourselves in the game uh, and let's, let's uh, keep our eye on the ball. Thank you to everybody. Thanks Thank for having me. Thank you, Wally. Yep. Thank you, everyone.